Bienvenido, Sushamdi, and welcome to this HUD-8 networking tutorial. This tutorial is titled The Director's Cut MPLS Layer 3 VPN. This is going to be a seven-part series, but as the title indicates, it's a director's cut, meaning that this is going to be a consolidated look at how you would set up an MPLS Layer 3 VPN. And in part one, we're going to be taking a look at the service provider core config. Now, the reason that I'm making this seven-part series is because I recently stumbled upon YouTube statistics inside of my account that I had not actually seen before. And so YouTube has this new feature where it will actually show you the top videos in terms of watch time minutes over the last 28 days. And it just so happens that four years ago, I did an MPLS L3 VPN tutorial, and I've got to admit, it was an absolute dumpster fire. I didn't have a really good computer at the time. My recording software wasn't the best. It was an older version of Camtasia. Uh, I have a Yeti Pro microphone now at this point, so the audio probably sounds much better. And again, it was four years old. But what's interesting is, over these last four years, I mean, here we are four years from when those tutorials were created, and those are actually the number one and number two most watched videos on my channel to this day. So I just went over a million views, and as a thank you to all of the viewers out there, I wanted to go ahead, clean up my presentation, and give you a 100% brand new look at how to set up an MPLS Layer 3 VPN. And again, it's a director's cut, so I'm not gonna be going deep dive on everything. If you're interested in that, keep your eyes peeled because I will have a course coming out at www.ine.com in the summer of 2019 where I'm doing a very, very deep dive on MPLS to include segment routing. So let's take a look at what the director's cut is going to be all about. So this module, module double zero, we're gonna go over the SP core configuration. We're gonna use OSPF. You could use intermediate system to intermediate system. You could use EIGRP. Both of those will be in my series on INE. We're gonna then take a look at the label distribution protocol configuration. We're then gonna configure the virtual routing and forwarding that needs to be set up on the provider edge routers. We're then gonna set up the multi-protocol BGP, or as I like to say, the multi-protocol IBGP between the provider edge routers. We're then gonna take a look at three different use cases. We're gonna set the PE to CE routing protocol up for EBGP, then we're gonna do it for EIGRP, and then finally, we're gonna do it for OSPF. And again, this is a sort of consolidated, trimmed down version of what you would expect in a more deep dive course. So we're gonna get right down to it here. Let's take a look at our topology. I'm doing everything in viral. And let me also say that everything that I'm doing, the in configurations in the final video on OSPF, there'll be a link in the description on YouTube that will take you to a Dropbox folder where you can download the configurations for every one of these routers. In fact, what I'll do is, there'll be a, uh, one zip file for the EBGP, CE to PE setup, then I'll do one for EIGRP, and then finally I'll do a third one for OSPF so that you'll have the configurations for everything that's going to be done here. So let's go ahead, let's take a look at the topology that we're gonna be dealing with. And this is it. Again, it's going to be very straightforward, and I'm doing everything in Cisco's Virtual Internet Routing Lab, or Viral. And so if you're not familiar with Viral, it's basically a virtual machine that runs on your host system. And you can see here with those seven routers that I have, or is it six? I can't remember how many routers we have. Seven, yeah. So the seven routers that I have, you can see that on the system I have here, we're taking up about 25% of the allocated resources between CPU, RAM, and the disk, right? So it's gonna run beautifully. It's gonna run much smoother uh, than my previous uh, tutorial video did. So again, I wanna keep these videos short and straight and to the point. So let's go ahead and set up OSPF 
in the service provider core network, which means we're going to be setting it up on PE1, P1, and PE2, or Provider Edge 1, Provider 1, and Provider Edge number 2. Let's jump onto the command line here. And again, this is all being done in viral. So here we are in Router 3 PE1. If I go from User Exec to Privilege Exec and then say Show IP Interface Brief, let's make sure that all of the interfaces are up. And you can see I also have my loopback address there. So let's dive into global config. And then we're going to say router OSPF1. Now, the first thing that we want to do, right, best practice, let's hard code that router ID. And I'm going to use something that cannot be confused with an IP address. This is also a very, very good best practice. You don't want to let OSPF select the router ID by default because then it's going to pick an IP that's either on a loopback interface or a physical interface, and sometimes that can cause some confusion when looking at output. Now, I'm using Viral, which means all of my interfaces are gigabit Ethernet interfaces. There are no serial interfaces in Viral. In fact, there are no plans to provide serial interface functionality in viral. So everything's giggy. So what I want to make sure I do here is I set the auto cost reference bandwidth and make it a thousand. And if I were to back up for just a second here, you can see that it's set in megabits per second. So that would be a hundred meg, but that's your default 10 to the eight. So I'm going to say 1000 to make it one gigabit per second. And that's just simply going to be for our cost. Now we're not going to be manipulating the OSPF cost, but this is a good best practice. You should be setting your auto cost reference bandwidth to the speed of the fastest link in your environment. Then I'm going to come out and I'm going to say passive interface default. So we're going to passive every interface on this router because there's only one interface on which I need to be running OSPF in order to establish an adjacency, and that's going to be Gigabit Ethernet 03. So I would just simply say no passive interface, Gigabit Ethernet 03. Now, what else do we need to do? Well, we need those network statements, right? Now, I could go under the interface as well, so I'm going to show you both ways to do that right now. So I could say network 10.3.4.3, and you may be stopping and saying, well, wait a second, why are you using the exact IP? Again, this is another best practice, and if you're looking to move on to the CCIE realm, I would definitely get familiar and comfortable with doing this as opposed to doing the oops sorry the wildcard mask like that. So you want to lock it down to just the individual interface on which you want that OSPF process to be running. And then again, we're going to put everything in area zero, right? And when we start to talk about the PE to CE routing protocol using OSPF, we're going to talk about the provider cloud becoming the MPLS super backbone. All right, so now I've started the MPLS process on that interface. In fact, if I say do show IP OSPF interface brief, we should see that on gig 03, we are now running the OSPF process. We see the area ID. We see the IP address and the mask. It's getting that from the interface configuration. And we see our cost, right? A cost of one because it's a gig interface. And we set the auto cost reference bandwidth. Our state is weight because again, on the other side, on router 4P1, we haven't configured anything just yet. So remember, I told you I was going to show you both ways to run the OSPF process on an interface. Well, let's get an interface loopback zero. And I'm simply going to say IP OSPF one area zero. So you can do it under the interface, or you can do it with a network statement under the OSPF global config stanza. All right, so OSPF is configured here. However, there's one more thing I want to talk about, and this gets overlooked quite a bit, and I'm grabbing my pen here. So let's pull up the drawing tool. So what I'm about to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set up OSPF prefix suppression. And you may be saying, well, what is IP OSPF prefix suppression going to do for me? Well, by default, OSPF is going to advertise the transit network segments, right? So it's going to advertise these segments in the provider core. Now, that's not a big problem in our environment here. We've got 
three routers in our provider core, but when you've got 50 or 100 or 1,000 routers in your core, you don't need the transit networks to be advertised because traditionally, that is what the loopback interface is going to be used for. The loopback interface is going to be used to provide me remote access to this router. So I would SSH to 3333 to get to router 3. I wouldn't SSH to the physical interface on the router. And so I can suppress in OSPF these advertisements. Now, I'm actually going to wait to do that until the very end so that you can see the difference between no OSPF prefix suppression and what happens when we configure OSPF prefix suppression. So let's clear the screen here. Whoops, let's clear the screen, get control of my cursor back. And let's go ahead and move on to router R4P1. And we're going to do much the same thing here. And again, it's a director's cut, so we're going to move right along. So I go from user exec to privilege exec in the global config. We'll say do show IP interface brief. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can see that our interfaces are ready to go. So we're going to say router OSPF1. I'm going to set my router ID to 0.0.0.4. .0 Again, something that can't be mistaken for an IP address. We're going to do a passive interface default. We're going to set the auto cost reference bandwidth to 1,000. And then I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to throw a network statement in here, and I'm going to do 10.3.4. Oops, sorry, 10.3.4.4. And we're going to do 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0, area 0. And this should actually result in a peering coming up here. Oh, sorry, I got to say no passive interface. I forgot my no passive interface, gig 0, 03. And let's get that in here, and let's do gig 0, 04 because it's going to be running on both of those. And there we go. So we have our OSPF adjacency up between router 3 and router 4. So if I say do show IP OSPF neighbors, <clears throat> and you can see here, right, the neighbor ID, clearly the router ID and not the IP address of the neighbor. This is the IP address of the neighbor. That's the router ID of the neighbor. So that's good for the interface between router 3 and 4 or PE1 and P1, but let's go ahead and let's put some variability in here. So I'm going to go into interface, gigabit ethernet 0, 04, and I'm going to say IP OSPF 1, whoops, area 0. So now I've set OSPF up between PE1 and P1. So what should I be able to see in my routing table? If I say show IP route OSPF, <clears throat> you can see that I see the 3333. Now, this is something that comes up a lot in CCNA courses I teach. You may be asking, well, wait a second, you said that we would see the transit network segments ad segments advertised, and we will. Why don't you see the transit segment advertised here in OSPF as an OSPF learned route? And the reason for that is that it's directly connected from the standpoint of router, th uh, I should say router 3 and router 4, or PE1 and P1, and you can see it's directly connected. So when we have two identical routes, for the same destination. What is the tiebreaker? Administrative distance. So OSPF is 110 and directly connected, right, is substantially lower than 110. So we've got OSPF set up on R4. Now let's come over to PE2 or R5. We'll go from user exec to privilege exec in the global config. And let's say do show IP interface brief. And we see what we've got here. So let's dive into, and actually, I'm going to do one more thing here. I just saw the loopback address. Let's say IP OSPF 1, area 0, on router 4, P1. I want to make sure that that loopback gets advertised or we'd run into issues with LDP down the line. So we're going to go ahead and say um, router OSPF 1. And we're going to do the same thing we did before, right? Set the router ID to 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.5. We're going to set the auto cost reference bandwidth, whoops, sorry, reference bandwidth to 1,000 for a 1 gigabit interface being our quickest speed. I'm going to say passive interface default, and then we're going to say no passive interface, and it's just simply going to be gig 04. Now, remember, those other interfaces, 05 and 06, those are facing my customer. So I'm not running OSPF on those interfaces. And the loopback, let's go ahead and do this. We'll say network 5.5.5.5, and we'll put the loopback in here as a network statement, and we're going to double up. I'm going to say 10.4.5.5, .5 .5, 
So you've seen some variability as to how we can set this up and how we can get everything configured and have OSPF, the process, running on different interfaces. And now we go from loading to full. So let's take a look at what we've got here. If I say show IP OSPF interfaces, right? We can see it's running on gig04 as well as the loopback interface. If I threw a brief at the end, we would see it in a nice consolidated format. If I said show IP OSPF neighbor, we should simply see that we have a single neighborship with the P1 router, router number four. Now, what about this show IP route OSPF? And that's what I'm talking about right there. So you see, we're running the OSPF process on the interface, and so OSPF is advertising into OSPF the transit segment. So let's talk about prefix suppression. I don't need these being advertised into OSPF. In fact, this is going to save us some LDP labels down the road as well. So I want to get this out of the routing table, right? So how do I do that? Because again, we're not telnetting or SSHing to the physical interface, the transit network segment. We're going to go to the loopback address. So what we would do is we would go under the interface in question that's running the OSPF process. In our case, it is do show IP interface brief. And they go four. Yeah, double checking here. So interface gigabit, Ethernet 04. And I'm going to say IP OSPF prefix suppression. Now, that by itself is not going to be enough. I need to now clear IP OSPF proc. So if you're in a live production environment, do not do this during the business day. This is what Brian McGahan likes to refer to as a resume generating event if you were to do this in your production network. So here we've got two interfaces, 03 and 04. 03 IP OSPF prefix suppression and then int gig 04. We're going to run that same command. And then I'm going to say clear IP OSPF proc, right? It's going to tear the adjacencies down. It's going to bring them back up. But the benefit is what we're going to see here shortly. So now let's get into uh, do show IP, whoops, IP interface brief. I can't remember the interface we're running on here. So let's dive into gig 03 in this instance. And we're going to say IP OSPF prefix suppression. And finally, clear IP OSPF proc. And we're going to say yes. All right, so for our core config, we're pretty much done. Now when I say show IP route, OSPF, I should not see the transit segment in there. And I don't. Now on P1, because of the way we're physically configured, you're not going to see it anyway, or you would not have seen it anyway. Because remember, P1 is directly connected to both transit segments. So I sh say show IP route OSPF, and we see the loopbacks for three and five. And then our final check here, oops, show IP route OSPF. And there we go. We see the loopbacks for three and four. So let's take a look at the config, show run, section router OSPF. Remember, I'll be providing all the configs. So that's router five, show run, section router OSPF. Here's router four, the P1 router. And finally, show run section router OSPF. So that is your basic OSPF configuration in a service provider core network. We've got good router IDs. We've got our auto cost reference bandwidth configured properly. We've got the passive interface default set up and we've no passive the interfaces on which we need that OSPF process to run to form adjacencies. We use the network statement to run the OSPF process on interfaces as well as loopbacks. And then we learned how to go into the interface and type in IP OSPF, the process ID number, and then the area number. All right, well, this is going to conclude our first Director's Cut video here, 00, zero on the service provider core configuration with OSPF. Our next video is going to be our LDP configuration or firing up MPLS. And we're going to talk about the MPLS label, the label stack. And we're going to talk about how we are going to be setting things up in our configuration. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you in the next video.